Welcome to our webinar on religion against human trafficking. Thanks for being with us today. Since last October, uh, we organized 16 webinars uh, on human trafficking in the light of the Laudato Si and Fratelli Tutti encyclicals. In our webinars, we highlighted the importance of the work of religious congregations in advocacy and assistance to victims of human trafficking and survivors at the local and international level. Many of us have no idea when or where the exploitation occurs and about the staggering number of victims. Unfortunately, human trafficking is growing every single day. At least 40, 40 million people today are living in slave-like conditions. That's bigger than the population of Argentina, California, or Canada. A third of the victims, more than 10 million, are children. These figures are conservative estimates agreed upon by governments and international organizations such as UNODC, ILO, UNICEF, IOM, and experts of the Office of the High Commissioner on Human Rights, as well as the Council of Europe and OSCE. Every country on earth is affected. In the European Union, there is an estimated number of slaves of nearly one million and a half. Many more victims are being identified online. For example, for pedopornography, the Meter Association, led by an Italian priest, Don Fortunato Di Notto, identified this year 21 million pictures of different abused children on European and North American based providers of services. More than 150 billion US dollars in illicit profits are generated annually by businesses employing slavery and exploitation. This is bigger than the revenues of Google, Microsoft, Apple, ExxonMobil, and JP Morgan Chase combined. Legal instruments exist at the international, regional, and domestic level. And all legal instruments and mechanisms are unfortunately notoriously insufficient and largely ineffective. The single most compelling reason that law, that law enforcement should not be the leading tool against human trafficking comes from this simple figure, 0.01%. 0.01%. This is a percentage of global estimated cases for trafficking, forced labor, child labor that might be considered resolved. It's a dreadful number, despite the billions that we are now spending on criminal prosecution. Prosecution is not an attainable end in itself. The fact is that the overwhelming majority of traffickers do not face justice and probably never will. Human trafficking is a truly special type of crime. The victim is a product. The primary witness is a victim often the only witness and victims are often so brutalized that they are not competent witnesses. The justice system is unfortunately not prepared for this. More ethical pressure should be brought on governments and civil society to improve legal instruments and mechanisms to implement more forcefully criminal prosecutions to address the demand of human trafficking to dedicate more resources to educate and train, to prevent and combat human trafficking, and to rehabilitate victims and survivors. That's why religious leaders should be key actors in mobilizing public conscience against human trafficking. On the 2nd of December 2014, International Day for the Abolition of Slavery, representatives of Christian denominations and major religions, Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, signed a joint declaration with Pope Francis as a public statement of their commitment to work together in spiritual and practical action 
to eradicate this crime against humanity and restore dignity and freedom to its victims. Before the signing of the Joint Declaration, each religious leader described his or her motivations for adhering to this document. Indeed, all spiritual traditions proclaim the golden rule that you must treat others as you would have them treat you. This means upholding and defending the dignity of human beings, which is a compromise by the globalization of indifference, whose grave, gravest consequences can be seen in modern form of slavery and human trafficking, the systematic deprivation of a person's liberty and abuse for his or her body, for example, through mutilation or organ removal for the purposes of commercial and sexual exploitation. We believe it was important to reaffirm this today, this appeal with speakers from various spiritual traditions. That's why I would like now to warmly thank today's speakers. First, Sister Miriam Baike, a moderator, representative at the UN in Geneva for the Sisters of Our Lady of Charity of the Good Shepherd. She worked for 30 years, 3-0, with survivors of trafficking in Germany and Albania. She will present the pastoral orientations on human trafficking. Second, His Eminence Cardinal Dieudonné Zapalanga and Imam Abdelwai Wassalige, bearing witness and taking action to avoid instrumentalization of religion by warlords and to promote reconciliation in the Central African Republic. And third, I'm very happy to have him now live, that's Dr. Reda Benkiran, sociologist, doctor in philosophy, an international consultant in Geneva who lives between Switzerland and Morocco. He's the author of books on complexity, interdisciplinary and intercultural issues, He is the founder and editor of the knowledge portal archipress.org and the research workshop ICBAL. Fourth, Rabbi François Garay, Rabbi of the Jewish Liberal Community of Geneva, GEL, and president of the Geneva Spiritual Appeal, L'Appel Spirituel de Genève. And last but not least, of course, Professor Aza Karam, uh, Secretary General, Religions for peace. And at the end of uh, this uh, discussion, you can ask questions in the Q&A section, and we shall answer them uh, in, in, uh, during the discussion. And lastly, you can find handouts of this webinar. Feel free to download and share them. And now, I would like to thank Sister Miriam Baike, co-organizer of this webinar, who shall now take over as moderator. Miriam, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, so we uh, heard recently uh, about the Pope uh, working very strongly with other religions. And to start our webinar, we want to uh, show firstly a short video from uh, Albania. Uh, Albania was the first European country the Pope visited in 2014. And we see here the um, witness of uh, three people working in the same shelter to assist victims of or survivors of uh, human trafficking. And they explain to us how they work together with their values and how this is a richness. Uh, 
që të punoj bashkë me kolegë të tjerë që u përkasi një pesimeve të të ndryshme, për më tepër përfituzve të organizatës, atyre që ne u aprojmë shërbime. Pesoj bilës është një vlerë shtuar fakti që edhe si staf, po edhe e grupi përfituzë dhe u përkasi pesimeve të ndryshme, duke të sikur kemi një gëshetim vlerash në grupë, qëfarë të banë dhe punën tonë më më të bukur edhe më të respektuar. Unë jam Ornela, psikologin në organizatën në të qëndër para vartë. Besimi im është protestant ose unë gjithorë në Shqipëri. Më përqeni shumë parimet e besimit im dhe më bëhem t'i praktikoj edhe në punën timi, sepse janë shumë humane dhe të rasim për të ndikmuar dhe për të përkushtuar viktimave të trafikimit apo njërës e në nevoj. Më përqenë në komunitetin e të cilin punoj, sëpse respektojnë dhe më përstesin njëri tjetrin dhe parimet që gjithë se cili ka. Kjo është një plus dhe një vlerë e shtuar e stafit tonë. Thank you. So here we see how on the ground people work together, living out the values of their different faith communities. But of course, there is more uh, to say about these values that are um, underlining different religions. And uh, this evening, we will hear from uh, several um, religions uh, how they approach uh, the fight uh, against human trafficking. Now, I will continue to uh, present um, the pastoral uh, orientation uh, from the um, Catholic Church. Uh, it's an example of guidance regarding human trafficking from the Catholic Church. In September 2015, the Holy Father told the United Nations that evils like human trafficking, the marketing of human organs and tissues, the sexual exploitation of boys and girls, slave labor, including prostitution, cannot be met by solemn commitments alone. We need to ensure that our institutions and indeed all our efforts are truly effective in the struggle against these scourges. So the purpose of the pastoral orientations on human trafficking is to enable a discussion about the problems and create awareness, motivation and support for the urgent and necessary long-term fight against human trafficking. Here we see the table of content. And it is a very interesting uh, because you, you see, of course, first we need to see the reality and we need to understand uh, the causes of human trafficking, to be able to fight it, and then also to acknowledge that this exists. We, we often don't acknowledge this, and also that we all are involved in this by, by creating a demand, by not knowing that uh, products we use um, might be uh, uh, produced by uh, people living in modern slavery, then um, we need to know the dynamics of human trafficking um, and then also when we understand the dynamics, how to answer. The pastoral orientation on human trafficking was published uh, on the 17th January uh, 2019. So uh, first, it explains the role of the church and faith in fighting against fa uh, false gods. That happens when the deity of money is in the center of an economic system rather than man, the human person. So at the center of every social economic system must be the person, the image of God, created to have domination over the universe. The inversion of values happens when the person is displaced and money becomes a deity. Catholic communities should denounce this false deity. Even more, they should be the yeast within societies by promoting significant changes at the local level towards the integral human development of all. 
Stakeholders can also do this by establishing an economy of com communion. We need to put the family back at the center of the business model. If the human family wishes to stamp out human trafficking, society itself will have to change. In order to bring human trafficking to an end, all people will need to simplify their needs, to control their habits, to rein in their appetites. Simplicity, moderation and discipline, as well as the spirit of sacrifice, must become a part of everyday life. Least all suffer the negative consequences of the careless habits of a few, and this implies avoiding the dynamic of domination and mere accumulation of pleasures. In my opinion, this already refers to the question of, of demand, what is always um, addressed to us. It is vital to safeguard the dignity of the human person, in particular by offering everyone real opportunities for, integ uh, for integral human development and by implementing economic policies that favor the family. Man is the source, the focus and the aim of all economic and social life. Now we need to understand human trafficking, the causes. First, commodification and exploitation. The economic, social and cultural phenomena that are shaping modern societies need to be subjected and to profound ethical assessment. These are manifestations of immoral social, cultural and economic systems and practices which promote consumerist attitudes and increase inequalities within and among regions. Coincidentally, our times have witnessed a growth of individualism and egocentricity, attitudes that tend to regard others through a lens of cool utility, valuing them according to criteria of convenience and personal benefit. Understanding human trafficking, again, it's continuing the causes, the demand aspect. Little is said about the consumers, the factor of demand, which traffickers continue to meet. The consumers constitute a huge mass who seem largely unaware of the exploitation of persons who are trafficked, yet enjoy the benefits and services they provide. People who generate the demand share real responsibility for the destructive impact of their behavior on other human persons and for the moral values violated in the process. Criminalizing the demand that drives human trafficking, especially related to sexual exploitation. To reduce the demand that drives human trafficking, accountability, prosecution and punishment are needed along the entire chain of exploitation, from the recruiters and traffickers to the consumers. The buying of so-called sexual services in all forms, including pornography, internet-based cybersex, strip clubs and erotic dancing venues is a serious offense against human dignity and human integrity, and an affront to human sexuality. So the essence is that this demand is criminal because I choose this, I know what I choose. In, in fact, if I buy something, I might not know the backgrounds, I might not be aware of it, I can't know everything. But buying a so-called sexual service, I know exactly what I'm doing. So we can have, have so here the uh, Pope uses these strong words of this is a crime. So we, that is, that's very uh, serious. Acknowledging human trafficking out of the shadows. So there is a reluctance to acknowledge the dire reality of human trafficking. Despite public commitments by states and non-state actors, and despite multiple 
awareness campaigns undertaken, there is still widespread ignorance of the nature and the spread of human trafficking. Furthermore, many of those potentially on the front line, such as law enforcement officers, public prosecutors, judicial authorities, and social and health professionals are often not sufficiently trained to identify human trafficking. And this implies, of course, the suggestion that, that this training has to be realized. So that is what is important. Identifying and reporting human trafficking. The identification and reporting on human trafficking crimes are hindered by several factors. The police investigations are difficult and long. The obstacles to gathering evidence of this criminal activity also include widespread corruption and lack of cooperation by the authorities in third countries. Resources are inadequate to address the crime by law enforcement and courts. The dynamics of human trafficking, an ugly, evil business. The connection to business. In industries such as agriculture, fishing, construction and mining, human trafficking has expanded through collaboration among numerous and various perpetrators. Modern finance, commerce, transportation and communications provide opportunities for the unscrupulous to enter into the system of entrapping and exploiting human persons. The crime is easily hidden within current business models. So we can come across this, you know, you enter a hotel, you are there and you don't know that there might be human trafficking. And there are also trainings in place to train um, the people who serve in hotels or to be guests in hotels, to be aware, to get an idea uh, what the, that this might be existing. And that is very important to, to raise this awareness about these phenomena because we don't hear uh, often about this and that is what is uh, clearly clearly spoken out in the pastoral orientation also the working conditions and supply chains it is good for people to realize that purchase purchasing is always a moral and not simply economic act hence the consumer has a specific social responsibility which goes hand in hand with the social responsibility of the enterprise. Increasingly competitive, competitive markets compel firms to cut labor costs and access raw materials at the lowest possible price. Human trafficking is often hidden within the labyrinth of supply, supply chains. And we, we all got awareness about this when in Bangladesh, the um, factory uh, where women um, were sewing clothes um, burned down and we had many uh, um, women dying and there was no insurance. And so we, so we, we got aware a little bit of, of this. And these are the clothing we are buying if we are not aware. The demand for cheap goods based on cheap labor needs to be promptly and properly addressed, both by raising public awareness and through legislation. Frequently, workers have no choice but to sign contracts with exploitative conditions. A sort of et ethical assessment of the human dimensions of supply, production, distribution and recycling rarely takes place. Catholic business leaders should put the church te teachings into praxis by providing decent working conditions and adequate pay to support one's family. And here we see that uh, the pastoral orientation is also related to the SDGs on decent work. So the, you find all these content uh, inside. Human trafficking and migrant smuggling. The most radical form of prevention is thus upholding the right to remain in one's country and place of origin, 
and ensuring that people have access there to basic goods and integral human development. And this is also now, I think this will become worse when the climate change continues. This will also cause people to leave. And this is also related to con what we consume and how we, how we um, react on, uh, on, on what is happening. And this will also um, make the situation worse. Responding to human trafficking, room for improvement. Bolstering cooperation. In some cases, the lack of cooperation between states means many people are left outside the law and without the chance to assert their rights, forcing them into a position between being taken advantage of by others or resignation to becoming victims of abuse. Providing support to human trafficking survivors. Appropriate shelter and decent work are important priorities, as well as access to the services of social workers, sociologists, therapists, lawyers, medical practitioners, hospital emergency department personnel and other professionals. Promoting reintegration. After traffic persons have been released and repatriated to their place of origin, reintegration needs to follow. But such national and international programs are quite rare. The reintegration of human trafficking survivors in society is no simple matter, given by the trauma they have suffered. The Pope says, I've always been distressed at the lot of those who are victims of various kinds of human trafficking. How I wish that all of us would hear God's cry. Where is your brother? Where is your brother or sister who is enslaved? Let us not pretend and look the other way. There is greater complicity than we think. The issue involves everyone. Pope Francis mentions this in the Encyclica Evangelii Gaudium. So now this was a presentation uh, of the pastoral orientation. We, we would like to, to uh, see now uh, Cardinal Yudonin Zapalanga, Imam Abdelwai Uwaselege. Eminence, Excellence. Merci euh, d'être venu à Genève pour porter ce message de dialogue et de fraternité euh, que euh, la plateforme des religions, des confessions euh, en euh, République centrafricaine euh, essaye de diffuser grâce à vos efforts à tous deux. Et aujourd'hui, j'aimerais vous poser la question, que fait euh, cette plateforme Que font les différentes confessions en République centrafricaine contre la traite des êtres humains. Je vous remercie pour nous donner la parole. Vous savez que la plateforme de confession religieuse a été fondée au cœur d'une crise. Ça veut dire que les centrafricains lambda étaient humiliés, maltraités, n'étaient pas considérés. Les enfants étaient enrôlés dans le groupe. Beaucoup de femmes étaient violées. Les droits de l'homme n'étaient plus respectés. Nous nous sommes levés comme pères, parce que le responsable de plateforme, c'est un pasteur. Il doit avoir le soin de ses brebis. Et nous nous sommes levés pour dire non, on ne peut pas continuer à tuer, à violer, à détruire, à hypothéquer l'avenir de nos enfants. Voilà pourquoi nous nous sommes levés pour aller à la rencontre de ceux qui ont pris des armes pour leur dire « Cet enfant que vous avez enrôlé, qui est innocent, certes enthousiaste, c'est pourquoi le Tarzan, mais c'est le cher à canon. Vous, vous avez un avenir. Parfois, parfois nous posons des questions aux gens en leur disant, au chef, est-ce que vous avez votre fils dans le groupe ?» En général, ils me disent « Non ». 
Ils n'ont pas leur fils. Mais vous n'avez pas votre fils. Pourquoi est-ce que le fils de l'autre est dans, dans, dans ce groupe-là Est-ce que votre femme est dans le groupe Non. Et si ce qu'on a fait, euh, vous faites à cette femme-là en, en la violant, si on faisait à votre femme, vous serez content Non. Nous sommes là pour éveiller les consciences, pour dire il y a des choses qu'on ne peut pas tolérer. Il y a des choses qui nous détruisent. Il y a des choses vraiment qui nous humilient et qui montrent que euh, l'être humain n'a plus sa valeur et nous devons avoir le courage de vérité, de venir vers ceux qui ont pris des armes pour leur parler. Et c'est un des rôles, une des missions, la plateforme. Non seulement le dire, seulement euh, au loin aux journalistes, mais aller en face des bourreaux, en face de ceux qui ont pris des armes pour leur dire. Le rôle aussi, la mission de plateforme, c'est d'interpeller le gouvernement parce que dans un pays, un gouvernement est chargé de protéger les populations. Et quand nous voyons que la dignité est menacée, dans notre devise, il y a unité, dignité, travail. La dignité est menacée. Gouvernement, que faites-vous Les gens pleurent, puisque nous devenons des porte parole de ces gens-là qui sont dans les villages et qui ne voient pas l'autorité politique, l'autorité administrative, judiciaire. Venez alors encore, prenez vos responsabilités. C'est aussi notre rôle. Dans un pays si fragile comme le nôtre, qui sort d'une crise et continue encore, eh bien, il y a la communauté internationale qui est présente. Cette communauté à travers les casques bleus, à travers euh, les civils qui travaillent, ou les humanitaires, nous disons, vous pouvez aussi apporter votre contribution pour aider à ce que cette femme violée, si on peut la soigner, dans les délais raisonnables, pour éviter les conséquences néfastes. Pour aussi porter votre, communauté, votre contribution, UNICEF, pour que l'enfant ne soit pas toujours dans ce groupe enrôlé et qu'on puisse l'intégrer, pour qu'il puisse chercher plus tard à trouver un emploi pour travailler. Pour aussi apporter votre contribution, si vous arrivez à donner une alternative à ces gens-là qui ont pris des armes, pour pouvoir laisser la population vaquer librement ses occupations, ne pas prendre la population en otage. Vous voyez là quelques ex exemples de l'engagement, la mission aussi de la plateforme ou de chaque religion que nous constituons auprès de ceux que vous avez appelés euh, qui souffrent ou qui sont quand même euh, considérés comme les, les traites de, 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 euh, oui, les, les traites et qui sont abandonnés et que nous nous venons à leur secours pour faire des plaidoyers et que nous-mêmes nous sommes là pour leur tenir la main, pour les consoler, les encourager, et orienter leur plainte, leur doléance vers les bonnes directions. Merci Éminence. C'est vous, Excellence, que pouvez-vous nous dire à ce sujet Vous savez que c'est un sujet très préoccupant pour les religieux, parce que notre combat, c'est pour donner à chaque être vivant sa dignité, mm -hmm. selon la Sainte Écriture. Et donc, notre travail au niveau de la plateforme, mais par congrégation aussi, euh, nous nous basons beaucoup plus sur les paroles. Vous savez que nous, nous n'avons pas de, de prison. Nous n'avons pas de force de répression. Notre force de répression, c'est les Écritures. Et ces Écritures euh, tranchent avec les méthodes de barbarie, les méthodes d'humiliation, les méthodes qui privent la personne de ses droits. C'est pourquoi nous prêchons à travers nos sermons, nos homélies, nos prédications. Nous appelons tout le monde au respect du droit de la femme. D'ailleurs, la femme, euh, c'est une créature que moi je qualifierais de précieuse pour l'avenir de l'univers tout entier, pour l'avenir de la société. Et pour nous, euh, nous nous basons sur le fait que la femme, elle est la, la première éducatrice de la progéniture, parce que c'est elle qui donne les premiers éléments. Donc elle mérite le respect, 
elle mérite quand même cette valeur, cette honneur. Et donc, pour nous, euh, il, il est hors de question de la faire subir le déshonneur. C'est pour cela que, surtout quand je me base sur l'enseignement de l'islam, c'est pour cela qu'il est interdit même à un homme d'avoir un rapport hors mariage avec une femme. Vous voyez Si déjà c'est interdit d'avoir un rapport hors mariage avec une femme, qu'est-ce que cela signifie Cela signifie qu'il faudrait d'abord remplir certains critères, certaines démarches, pour pouvoir euh, être en communion avec une femme et prétendre partager le, le même espoir, le même devenir avec cette femme-là. Elle devient avec vous un seul corps et vous constituez un foyer. Si vous allez faire des enfants, vous devez éduquer ces enfants-là. C'est tout un processus pour nous, pour protéger une femme. Donc, en définitive, nous sommes dans un état. L'état est organisé. Et pour nous, la plupart du temps, euh, s'il y a des choses, nous dénonçons publiquement. Nous haussons le ton. Nous parlons. Nous indexons. Mais qui est à l'État de prendre ses responsabilités pour pouvoir euh, mettre la main sur les fossoyeurs, ceux qui, font, euh, qui, qui, qui violentent la femme ce qui humilie la femme. Il faut que l'État mette la main. En se basant, bien sûr, sur des informations, des renseignements crédibles. Et c'est ça notre travail au quotidien. Donc, c'est pour vous rassurer oui. que nous, en tant qu'entité religieuse, vous soulevez là pour nous un sujet qui nous préoccupe au quotidien. C'est notre travail au quotidien, la protection de la femme, de l'enfant. Voilà. Merci beaucoup. Est-ce que peut-être vous voudriez rajouter un mot Que font par exemple des paroisses ou des euh, groupes locaux euh, pour réintégrer des personnes qui auraient été victimes de la traite Que ce soit des enfants qui sont démobilisés de groupes armés, que ce soit des femmes qu'on arrive à sortir de la prostitution, que ce soit des adultes qui travaillaient dans des mines ou euh, dans l'agriculture et qu'on arrive à réintégrer dans leur groupe quand on arrive à remettre, je dirais, euh, sur leurs pieds et sortir de l'esclavage. Comme vous posez la question directement, je vais vous répondre aussi directement. Oui. Vous dites, euh, Église catholique. Oui. Eh bien, euh, je prends le cas des femmes qui ont été violées et parfois qui ont perdu leur honneur dans ce second endroit, mm. ou parfois les hommes les rejettent. Euh, nous avons un lieu qu'on a appelé aujourd'hui bon, à Boyali, on a conçu une maison pour dire ces genre de personnes qui ne sont pas bien vues ailleurs, nous pouvons les accueillir. Bravo. Et on va leur, ils vont cultiver le champ, ils vont refaire reprendre leur vie et peut-être qu'ils pourront encore repartir, retrouver le chemin d'espoir. Donc, c'est un début, c'est rien. Hein, il y a quelques personnes qui sont là, mais c'est ça le, le but. Nous cherchons à construire un centre pour, pour ces jeunes-là. Nous avons déjà euh, les Salésiens, mm -hmm. Don Bosco, qui s'occupent des jeunes. Ils s'occupent des jeunes hein, qui sont dans ces situations difficiles et ils, les, ils leur donnent la chance souvent d'apprendre des métiers et pouvoir les insérer pour pouvoir commencer une nouvelle, euh, un, nouveau, euh, un nouvel avenir et donc je crois que c'est aussi important. Nous avons chez nous les femmes, un groupe qu'on appelle les femmes chrétiennes qui repèrent les autres femmes qui sont rejetées, on fait un travail pour leur intégration parce que c'est pas facile quand vous avez été violé, pointé du doigt et autres eh bien, il faudrait qu'il y en a qui, qui, qui vous défendent et qui soient euh, comme les intermédiaires pour vous aider à trouver votre place et que vous êtes victime, hein, que vous n'êtes pas bourreau et qu'on n'ajoute pas le mal au mal encore pour vous exclure de la société. Donc, il y a ce travail aussi qui se fait et autres. Donc, nous demandons aux uns aux autres d'être attentifs. 
Parce que là, il y a la commission de justice et paix. Mmh. Comme ça, je suis épais, qui est attentif dans le quartier pour voir s'il y a ce genre de situation avec euh, les prostituées, situation avec euh, peut-être euh, d'autres personnes, pour voir comment rétablir la justice, mmh. comment faire à ce que la paix revienne dans la société, dans le cœur des uns et aussi dans la communauté. C'est aussi leur rôle. C'est là quelques démarches que nous faisons au niveau des paroisses ou bien encore au niveau de certains groupes, au niveau de certaines congrégations qui ont comme vocation de s'engager pour aider les enfants. Voilà ce que je peux vous dire. Merci, très intéressant. Est-ce que vous voudriez ajouter quelque chose Oui, juste un tout petit peu au niveau de la plateforme. Vous savez, la plateforme aujourd'hui est structurée. Mm -hmm. Il y a un comité de la jeunesse qui oui. s'occupe de la préoccupation de la jeunesse. Il y a aussi euh, là un bureau qui s'occupe des affaires des femmes. Et dans ce bureau, euh, vous voyez, tout ce qui concerne les femmes, devient, ça devient parfois un tabou. Mmh. Vous savez, on ne peut pas en parler avec n'importe qui. Or, les femmes, entre elles, vous voyez, c'est plus facile de traiter les sujets qui les concernent. Bien sûr. C'est pour cela qu'il y a un bureau qui est là, euh, qui traite de, ce, de ces problèmes-là. Mmh. qui s'occupe de ces problèmes-là et les femmes violentes et violées qui ont subi le déshonneur sont parfois identifiées, répertoriées et il y a une démarche qui est parfois, parfois menée pour euh, voler à leur secours mmh. je dirais même loin pour les aider à accéder à la justice mmh. ah, très bien vous voyez ah, très bien. Donc, il y a déjà un mécanisme qui existe. Ça, c'est au niveau de la plateforme des confessions religieuses dont nous sommes les représentants. Mais au niveau confessionnel, comme mmh. le cardinal l'a dit, oui. nous, au niveau du Conseil supérieur islamique, mmh. nous avons un bureau appelé Bureau national de, des femmes musulmanes. Mmh. Dans ce bureau, euh, il y a un comité euh, qui s'occupe euh, des orphelins, des veuves, et puis des femmes violentées, ainsi mmh. de suite. Et donc, c'est un peu hiérarchisé et le sujet se traite à ce niveau-là. Donc, on ne peut pas se permettre quand même de mettre sur la place publique les, les problèmes qui intéressent cette catégorie de personnes vraiment déshonorées. Mais euh, nous sommes conscients, nous sommes conscients de cette situation. C'est pour cela que des mécanismes sont mis en place pour s'occuper de la question. Très bien, merci mille fois. Je sais que vous êtes attendu. Euh, alors, je voudrais... Non seulement vous remercie, mais vous souhaitez vraiment plein succès dans tout ce que vous faites. Et aussi que le message que vous avez essayé de porter dans le film Siriri, le cardinal et l'imam, euh, soit vraiment bien compris. Et que votre action en faveur des victimes de la traite, pour prévenir la traite, pour la combattre, pour réhabiliter toutes ces victimes, euh, puisse continuer. En tout cas, merci, tous mes voeux et euh, j'espère qu'on reste en contact et qu'on va euh, pouvoir aussi euh, soutenir votre action. Je vous remercie. sanglant en République centrafricaine. Une attaque dans l'église de Fatima dans le troisième arrondissement de Bangui aurait fait 99 blessés et 16 morts. Les ONG sur place font savoir qu'une mosquée aurait également été détruite. Chers compatriotes centrafricains, centrafricaines, je souhaite toutes mes condoléances à toute la famille catholique de Centrafrique. Kodrosu, à musulman qui est là, avant la Dumbi. Les Gambibans, ils ont été musulmans, ou à chrétiens, et qui mélangé, mais ne tient que encore, ils ont été Nos religions ne prônent pas la violence, bien au contraire, la fraternité, l'unité. Voilà pourquoi nous nous sommes mis ensemble pour dire non à la violence.
what a witness. I, I have the feeling we all need to take some deep breaths to be able to listen now to Dr. Reda Benkiran. Thank you very much. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you. I just uh, I'm happy to be with you and to share with you some uh, some observations and reflections based on my own work as a researcher, uh, researcher, uh, socio as a sociologist and anthropologist. I have worked on, on religions, on different aspects of religions. And uh, my observations are mainly based on a research that uh, uh, I have made uh, five or six years ago for the, the United Nations, for UNDP, and it was made in collaboration with the Center for Humanitarian Dialogue, the HD Center in Geneva. I was the scientific director of a research uh, which aimed to understand drivers and sins of the soil. And as you know, uh, in this region, uh, violent extremism is often, uh, um, you know, uh, is often uh, existing, but in the name of religion or inspired by by, by religion. So it was uh, 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 on this. Uh, oh, uh, we had the opportunity to to do a, a, a survey, a field survey of an unprecedented uh, scale in eight countries of of the CIELs, and the idea was to do a perception study to to go in the uh, regions where people are directly conf confronted or affected by uh, by violent extremism by insecurity uh, by even by jihadist groups and uh, we wanted to know how they perceive all these 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 these, these uh, manifestations uh, and from there we based we developed uh, you know uh, uh, a sort of uh, of uh, presentation of their own uh, concepts, and uh, I invite you to to consult um, uh, the research notebook uh, online, sahelradical.hypothesis.org. Uh, uh, I repeat, sahelradical.hypothesis.org, uh, uh, which is uh, deploy all the, the the sum on radicalization that we have produced with a. Uh, um, with eight teams of African uh, researchers, uh, and uh, these, uh, there is a, an international report and eight national reports that are available in English and in French. Uh, regarding to the to the topic that is uh, that is um, discussed uh, during this webinar, I I just want I have a few observations. In fact, I'm not. Uh, and uh, a specialist of this issue of slavery or, or servitude. But uh, what I think it's interesting to share with you is that during this, this, uh, this survey, I have, uh, we, I have, we have identified that uh, uh, slavery and servitude might be the hidden variables of current the current radicalization so i need to explain a little bit what i mean by that is that if we look at the the sahel in terms of historical uh, process we see that this region is uh, has uh, a, 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 a profound state tradition there have been empires uh, st uh, states or different kind of states even religious states uh, in the 19th century uh, and uh, a variety. There, there were a variety of political institutions, and and uh, uh, and these have also uh, included the trading states, warrior states, and others, which have practices the capture of slaves. I'm referring to the past, huh? so uh, to before even the colonization, huh? uh, the colonial period, and. What I want to 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 to, share, to to show is that in the past, over the course of history, the endemic insecurity of the Sahel state has been leaked in part to their inability to protect their citizens from enslavement. You know, for instance, between when clashes between ethnic groups were were occurring, and or um, 
or for instance, uh, at other times to the prophet, they were able to make them to make from slavery. And this phenomenon of 17th century, after the arrival of the Portuguese and uh, followed by the Dutch, the English and the French. So what I want to focus here is, is that in contrast to the expensive aspect of the original Salian state, we have in this region, and this was uh, some, for me something really new, we have a, a very rigid social structures. I mean, in this region of the Sahel, which is a super space, uh, we have to say that society is based on a very hierarchical structure, which is a society based on caste. And so here you have the, 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 the example of a, a traditional society where slavery has uh, an existence. So, so what I want to, sh to show is that when I said that slavery and, and, and slavery might be the hidden variables of radicalization, we, we, we discovered that maybe in a certain manner, violence that is happening in the name of religion and in the name of new forms of religion, uh, which are bellicous, uh, this, uh, this process of violence in a certain manner reflects a kind of reaction to you know, a tradition of, of, of slavery and servitude. Because uh, for instance, we have noticed in, 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 in the Chad, we did, we did a, a survey in, in Chad, and the people who were responsible of this uh, survey found out that, for instance, there are some groups that are known as Haddad. So those, uh, uh, those are you know, from lower castes, and they are ostracized and compelled to marry only among themselves. And when nothing in terms of their physical appearance uh, or their culture or their language distinguishes them from other social groups. And according to the author of the national report on Chad, which is available on the, the research notebook, uh, which is online that I mentioned to you, the cruelty and the level of violence of the armed group be explained in terms of revenge, again, which has discriminated people seen as improved and of lower caste. So, for instance, if you take the example of, 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 of uh, Boko Haram, uh, which is operating in almost four countries in the region, you will see that there is the people of lower caste or are, who are considered from, you know, as impure, uh, you know, uh, have seen in the new forms of religion a way to promote their own um, their own status. And uh, so what I want to, to focus here is that when we see these new forms of, uh, of expressions, for instance, the political, political Islam or Salafi or even jihadists, in, 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 if you see uh, the, the effect in terms of violence, you, you may observe that these groups may threaten citizenship. But when you see on the other side, how they promote a certain form of fraternity and equality, you will see that in a certain manner, they also are accelerator of, 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 uh, of, of uh, citizenship. So this ambivalence, this ambiguity, how religion can be used in a certain manner for, for violence, but also uh, the fact that religion can be also new forms of religion can be a, a way to, 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 to establish equal, equality between, between people uh, is, is something that is, uh, that is observed, uh, for instance, in, in, the, in, the, in this Sahelian uh, uh, space. If, let's take a concrete example of Mauritania. You know, there is a caste structure in Mauritania and its social order you know, orders are arranged according to four broad categories. You have nobles, for instance. You have people of the sword, of a pen. There are warriors or marabouts. You have free men and women, you know, that uh, are the archetype, uh, uh, in, they are mainly artisans, griots or smiths in, in the Moor community, or uh, woodworkers in the black African communities, or weavers and shoemakers. 
You have dependence, dependence. This is the third category. You have the hard things and, 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 and they are dependent or dominated by more powerful groups or tribes or clans. And you have the servants. Uh, so the result of this structure is relatively rigid, uh, rigid social structure, a complex tangle of relationship and behavior and very limited social mobility. Endogamy is the rule, exogamy is the exception. And even if you see the Mauritanian state has made an effort to banish, for instance, uh, slavery in the beginning of the 80s, you, this perception of uh, a, a so, traditional social, social structure is very, uh, you know, very in, uh, important in, in, in terms of mindset. And what I want to say is that the new forms of religion that are taking place and sometimes even using uh, violence and extremism violence, they, we can explain their success partly because the, young, the youngsters uh, see these groups as indifferent to the social origin. When you are a Hartani, when you are of the lower caste, you can, you can be a very successful person in your life, in your business. You can be a, a scholar, a religious scholar, but you, in the, according to the social traditional structure, you, you will always be seen by the dominant uh, mentality as something as someone different or someone is of a lot. The important thing I want to say is the new uh, movements that we see through that can be ranked among, you know, as you know, manifestations of political Islam or Salafi or even jihadist, these groups do not establish a difference. If you are from the lower category, but you are a scholar, you can guide us, you can guide the, uh, the, 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 the prayer. You, you are not impure. We, these groups are based on a sort of, uh, you know, horizontal structure. And this is a way, in a certain manner, they are accelerators of, 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 uh, of, of citizenship. What I want to say in, 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 in these in, in this concrete examples, there are many descriptions in, in the different national reports, is that we must not be things in terms of, you know, binary things, but there is a lot of ambivalence. Violence can be also a way to, to reflect, you know, a, 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 an injustice in terms of social structure. And uh, you see, uh, we have not yet finished with the debate on slavery. If, even if it, there is a moral progress now, slavery is, is banished, is condemned, but we see, for instance, let's take the example of the United States of, of America, more than 100 years, 200 years after the, the, you know, the end of slavery in certain states, we see the consequences of, of slavery, of slave trade in expressions of current political movement, such as, such as social political movement, such as, as Black Lives Matter. I mean, this issue of slavery has to be uh, analyzed, and I think that one way, uh, uh, one way to to approach it is that uh, for each, um, you know, for each category, each culture, each society should be able to develop a kind of self-criticism. For instance, if we take the example of of the Sahel, of course, uh, there is the, the the American trade slave that has been very, very, very important the Arab uh, trade slave, but we have to see, and that is something that is not yet sufficiently evoked. We have to, con con to observe that slavery is part of the traditional social structure of this, of this region. And this is, has to be thought, this has to be discussed by scholars, religious scholars, but intellectuals, etc. And it's, very, you know, it's very easy to 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 diff to to establish the responsibility of such treatment of of humans 
to others, to people who are outside the community. But I think that a proper way to, to approach this issues is that each society should be each could be able to uh, analyze and develop a kind of self criticism to see what in 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 its uh, in the specificities of of the, the historical context what has favorized you know such uh, such uh, such uh, uh, such exploitation uh, of, of humans so this is the those are the very brief and general observations based on a, a field sur survey in the Sahel, and I hope that uh, it might, uh, you know, enrich uh, the discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ben Kiran. Uh, this was very interesting indeed. How you showed how uh, the historical. Um, the history of a, of a country has to be seen and studied so that the religions there should overcome the violence and injustice that are found there because uh, there, there are obviously blind spots in, in this all this complexity and you showed it very well uh, by presenting uh, your research, your very interesting uh, research which can also, um, there is something to be downloaded in the handout and uh, also the link to the website you said is already put in the chat for the people who want to follow up. So thank you very much for that, uh, Dr. Benkiran. Uh, now we uh, will uh, listen to the contribution of uh, Rabbi Francois Garay and uh, his contribution will be a, a video recording. Les religions contre le trafic d'êtres humains. Quand on considère ce qui se passe dans notre monde, nous nous appelons les religions contre le trafic d'êtres humains. Quand on considère ce qui se passe dans notre monde, nous nous apercevons que très souvent les religions sont invoquées pour asservir, rejeter l'autre. C'est pourquoi dans l'association de l'appel spirituel de Genève, nous avons dit que nous ne pouvions pas et que nous ne devions pas invoquer une religion ou une philosophie pour asservir l'autre. Et pourtant, tel est parfois le cas. Et pourtant, nos traditions religieuses, quelles qu'elles soient, peuvent être invoqués pour refuser ce trafic d'êtres humains. Et le refuser à partir de leurs principes fondamentaux. Les religions d'Orient et d'Extrême-Orient prônent le détachement. Il faut se détacher du monde, il faut se détacher des envies, il faut se détacher des désirs. Donc comment peut-on prôner le détachement et en même temps utiliser les autres, quels qu'ils soient, pour quoi que ce soit Il y a une profonde contradiction entre ce refus de l'avidité, cette invitation au détachement et le trafic d'êtres humains. Dans nos traditions monothéistes, il y a également une profonde opposition avec le trafic d'êtres humains. L'islam le dit dans le Coran, le judaïsme et le christianisme le disent dans la Bible, où il est écrit dans le premier chapitre de la Genèse, que Dieu créa l'humain, mâle et femelle, il les créa. Dieu créa ha Adam, l'humain, et non pas Adam, comme un être masculin. Mâle et femelle, Zahar ou Nekeva bara Otam, il les créa. Et notre tradition dit, eh bien, au début, Dieu avait en quelque sorte accolé l'homme et la femme. 
Les uns disent dos à dos, les deux autres disent côte à côte. C'est pourquoi dans le deuxième chapitre, dit ce même commentateur, Dieu sépara la partie mâle, Adam, et la partie femelle, Ève. Et lorsque Adam regarde Ève, puisque tout d'un coup il se trouve face à face et non plus dos à dos ou côte à côte, il dit « Mais elle, elle est etsem me atsamai » qui est traduit habituellement par « os de mes os » mais en fait « substance de ma substance » Qu'est-ce que cela veut dire Cela veut dire qu'il y a une identité parfaite entre l'homme et la femme et que donc il ne peut pas y avoir l'un qui soit supérieur à l'autre, qui prenne possession de l'autre, comme il ne peut pas y avoir, au niveau humain, l'un qui prenne possession de l'autre, quel qu'il soit. Dieu créa l'Adam, Ha-Adam, et non pas Adam seul. Nous sommes tous, dit notre tradition rabbinique, nous sommes tous les descendants de la même unité humaine, de la même souche humaine. C'est le texte qui le dit. Nous savons que dans l'évolution de l'humanité, dans l'évolution de la création, il n'en a pas été totalement ainsi. Mais c'est l'idée qui compte. L'idée que l'humanité est une et unique. Alors certes, certains ont la peau un peu jaune, d'autres un peu rouge, d'autres un peu noire, d'autres un peu blanche. Mais au-delà de cette apparence, nous sommes tous identiques les uns aux autres. Notre corps fonctionne exactement de la même façon. Notre esprit illumine notre cerveau de la même façon. Nous sommes différents parce que nous sommes nés dans un contexte géographique, social, culturel, religieux, particulier. Mais au-delà de cette particularité, nous sommes tous substance de la même substance. Il est donc impensable, religieusement parlant, si l'on regarde nos textes, il est impensable de pouvoir être favorable au trafic humain. Il est impossible d'invoquer nos religions, comme nous le disons dans l'appel spirituel de Genève, il est impossible de les invoquer pour prendre possession de l'autre et en faire ce que nous voulons qu'il soit, c'est-à-dire le dégrader de son humanité pour en faire un objet. Nous sommes tous des êtres humains avec un reflet divin, avec une lumière en nous, et c'est ce reflet divin et cette lumière qui est en nous que nous devons reconnaître en l'autre. Et lorsqu'il en sera ainsi, eh bien notre monde sera certainement plus lumineux qu'il ne l'est à l'heure actuelle. Les religions doivent être invoquées pour s'opposer à tout trafic humain. Tel est leur message, ou plutôt, tel doit être leur message. Merci. Uh, merci, that was a, a very a deep reflection on the human being being the same, from the same substance and so if one possesses the other, uh, that means degrading the human being. Uh, after having heard this, we come to uh, Professor Azar Karam, the uh, Secretary, Secretary General for Religions for Peace, 
and his contribution uh, is also a video message. Yes, uh, excuse me, Miriam. I, I would like to say it will mm -hmm. be a quite interesting uh, video, and I think we have two questions. Uh, and uh, um, before it's too late, I would like uh, uh, to ask you whether we could address those two questions. And for example, uh, Reda, do you see the question number two, the Marcela uh, Simonski uh, uh, Q&A? If you click in the Q&A, could you That's wait for Sub-Saharan Africa? How much of the condemnation of slavery exists in the villages? Is there a majority of people who justifies it as a revenge or something they deserve? I don't know whether you, you feel like answering this question now or... Yeah. You, uh, yeah? Uh, I can answer now if you want. Uh, I mentioned my uh, my few observations based well, were based on one indicator. I said that slavery and servitude might be the hidden. It's not explicit, exposed. Uh, well, because we have to take in, uh, in the, diff the eight countries where uh, we did the survey, the different de uh, indicators, demographic indicators. These regions are now uh, in um, subject to, uh, you know, a very important uh, demographic growth with a very high level of fertility rate. Just to give you some examples, we have fertility fertility rate ranging from five to seven, more than seven in Niger. In Niger, Niger. Uh, the, the percentage of, of the young people, the population under 15 uh, uh, oscillates between 40 to 50 and more than 50% of the population. The importance of the literacy, literacy rate of young people aged between 15 and 24, it's, it's, it's between 40 to, to, to 60 and 70%. So what, what, what in the region of the Sahara, it's a, a, a massive transformation, a demographic modernization. And when I say that slavery, servitude, those are remnants from the past states, the official states have made an effort to banish slavery, etc. I mean, they, and uh, are, uh, you know, are fought. But the problem is that we still have a, a predominant a traditional mentality. And this is something that is not explicit. And when I say that a modern civil society is based, you know, on equality of citizens, but in this region, unfortunately, can bring very important and positive things, but there are also archaism. And among these, you know, these negative impacts, there is this question of slavery, this question of servitude. Uh, so it is not explicit. And it's part of, you know, for instance, in the, uh, I mentioned the, the importance of the young uh, generations, but in terms of symbolic um, predominance, it's the elder who, who is, you know, uh, still dominating this the, the, the traditional society. So this this shows you the the, the some elements that, that may explain explicit the, the current radicalization. There are multiple factors that are take that are playing a role, and I would say that the issue of of civility is something that is hidden but is really active. We cannot explain the level of violence if we don't have in mind the hierarchy uh, in terms of, of, of traditional structure. And that, you know, so, so those societies are rapidly changing and this creates, you know, this, uh, this phase of violence. But I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not uh, very pessimistic in the long-term perspective. For me, this is, a, we have to see this, this what is happening to, uh, today with the importance of violence of radicalization 
as something temporary. It's part of the, you know, the transformation, you know, from the, you know, and, and this is my, my response. Um, I will not say categorically, categorically that, uh, you know, these factors are, you know, discussed and put in, uh, you know, in evidence. But when you work, you approach it in terms of sociology, uh, anthropological terms, you, you find that they play a role. First, I would like to thank Reda for his very courageous uh, uh, statement. And, and still, if I may uh, uh, answer the first question by, uh, on technology. And briefly, because after that, we'll, we'll give uh, 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 a chance to, to see uh, um, Dr. Azakaram uh, uh, video. But technology, in a nutshell, I would say technology is certainly useful against, uh, uh, against trafficking. But unfortunately, there is a technological race. And for the time being, this te technological race is won by traffickers not by uh, uh, people combating trafficking uh, and actually using uh, what we know today uh, to try to uh, control uh, uh, the COVID uh, pandemic. Um, I must say, I, I'm not sure it will, it will work uh, in, the good, uh, in the good sense. Uh, so uh, I, could, uh, I could give you more details if you want uh, on uh, uh, technology and human trafficking it's well beyond what we are supposed to discuss today, but I just want to uh, to tell you: look at what Don Fortunato Di Noto uh, said about the use of technology uh, to promote pedopornography, to to actually abuse children, and actually it's it's frightening. It's frightening uh, in more than one account. Uh, not only by the sheer number of uh, people trafficked online, but also by the fact that most of the servers are in uh, Europe and North America. And actually, it, it is public that one of the main providers is in France, uh, is free. And uh, so it's public. Um, and again, uh, it, it was published in, uh, in newspapers. I think uh, uh, again, I could I could provide you with uh, with documents on this, but I must say, unfortunately, uh, yes, we should uh, use technology, but governments actually should be more active in uh, in monitoring what is happening on servers, and possibly with that uh, we could uh, avoid uh, uh, the spread of uh, uh, of uh, human trafficking uh, in uh, on the net against children, but also against women and men. Very welcome. Very interesting uh, discussion. So now we will uh, listen to the contribution by video uh, from uh, Professor Azar Karam, the Secretary uh, General from uh, Religions for Peace. Greetings of peace. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Azza Karam, and I have the privilege to serve Religions for Peace International. For those of you who may not know, Religions for Peace is the United Nations of Religious Institutions and Faith Communities, just as the United Nations has member governments, member states. Um, Religions for Peace has members which are religious institutions and representatives of faith communities around the world. Almost every faith tradition known to humankind has representatives sitting on the governing board or the World Council of Religions for Peace. It is always very interesting to see how these different religious institutions and faith communities come together on issues of the common good. As you can well imagine, there are many areas of difference. But what Religions for Peace maintains and seeks to serve is precisely the common good. In other words, far from the realms of theological disputation, but still very much grounded within an interreligious or a multi-religious engagement and dialogue, Religions for Peace has 50 years of convening 
over 90 interreligious councils in over 90 countries. The interreligious councils are platforms for primarily joint advocacy, speaking together as one, which is a very big deal when one thinks of the power of one religion to influence behaviors, attitudes, political positions, even elections, not to mention very contentious issues. Imagine when all religious institutions and faith communities convene together to speak on justice as one, on the common good of all. So the motto of leaving no one behind is very much the business of all religions working together. What is the link between that kind of power, the power to come together, to speak together, and to speak on issues of justice together? Imagine what it is like. And also imagine what it is like when these institutions and communities actually serve certain common needs together. There is not a single religion in history, and I trust you will have listened to many religious speakers by now. There's not a single religion that will advocate for what is effectively modern day slavery or human trafficking. There's not a single faith tradition which will advocate for it. There are even fewer faith traditions which would ever engage in supporting this practice. Nevertheless, it goes on. It happens. By some statistics, we hear 40 million human trafficked persons around the world. The violations exceed expectation. They range from everything from sexual slave trade to organ trade to abuse of people's time, energy, resources, and power. In every single case, it is a violation of human dignity at best. At worst, it is also a violation of anything that upholds our values and principles anywhere in the world. It is vital that religious communities and institutions in particular, that religious leaders who impact so strongly on people's behavior it is vital that such religious leaders, oh, excuse me, when I say religious leaders who impact strongly on people's behaviors, I am not talking about Western Europe. I'm talking about the rest of the world, where religious leaders, religious institutions, faith communities are still the strongest source of influence on individual and public behavior and norms. They remain very critical behavior change agents. This is why it's absolutely important for us to appreciate what it is like when different religious institutions and leaders come together to speak out against harm being done. Now imagine when these religious leaders and institutions can come together to advocate together, but also to serve those who are survivors of human trafficking. Of course, with different religious institutions do so. Most, in fact, do serve not only the purpose of advocacy, but the service to those who, ha who have been injured and who are survivors of human trafficking. But imagine the power of them working together to serve all those who can come. It is the power not only of one institution and its members and its believers to heal and to seek to heal, but it becomes the power of many institutions, communities, and believers to actually pool their resources together to heal and to ensure that this never happens in any guise or form. Because of the preponderance of the numbers of sexual exploiters and human traffickers who come and who are trafficking from the Asian context, there is a very large number 
in that part of the world who are unfortunately subject to the vagaries of human trafficking. Because of this, our Asian affiliate, the Asian Conference of Religions for Peace, has been working for several years, nearly two decades, on raising awareness within the different faith communities, within different civil society, on the not only the harm done, but also raising awareness in schools and public education institutions, raising awareness among healthcare people, raising awareness amongst those who are serving the security services, raising awareness about what human trafficking is, how it happens, the kinds of victims, the stories, the realities, the pain and the means of trying to serve the needs of these different and very diverse groups and multiple groups of victims. Raising, you would think raising awareness is not such a big deal, but in fact it is. Because even though we have the number roughly of 40 million, we actually don't have the number of services collated together at multiple levels of governmental, intergovernmental, and non-governmental interventions geared towards serving and saving victims of human trafficking, survivors of human trafficking. We actually don't know how many services, public institutions, private institutions, private individuals are actually serving these needs. But we do know how many religious institutions exist in most parts of the world. We do know how massive the communities of believers, when you collate them together across the different and diverse faith traditions, we do know that these are massive populations. Being able to enlighten and educate about the what, where, when, how, why, and who the victims and the survivors of human trafficking are is not a minor accomplishment. Being able to come together to raise awareness together as different religious leaders underlines a commonality of purpose and a political will that is very difficult, that is very difficult to equal. Our challenge is not so much in being able to ensure that governments and security services and health providers and educational institutions are made aware respectively, perhaps an even bigger challenge is how it is that we can combine the resources of the different religious institutions so that they are able to serve better together. And this is precisely what Religions for Peace has been doing. Interestingly enough, within the context of the Asian Conference of Religions for Peace, and that is over 20 interreligious councils across the Asian continent, the leaders of the awareness raising movement and the service providers within the religious communities tend to be largely women. This is not unusual when we consider that women of faith or women who are affiliated with different religious groups and institutions, many of them, by the way, unpaid, many of them, if not most of them volunteers, that it is often they who understand and see the ease with which some can become victims. But they are also committed to serve. Women of faith are not usually spokespersons for religious institutions. That is often the role relegated to men. Women of faith, however, are 90% of the service providers in religious institutions around the world. Their job may not be to speak. Their job may not be to preach. Many of them, even though increasingly many of them are. But their job most definitely has always been historically to serve communities. And in very, very, very rare cases are many of these women actually compensated for their labor, their intensive labor of service, of love, of joy, the burden of love which is service to their communities. They are therefore very much deeply rooted in the fabric of their communities. They are therefore able to be the first to see and to sense and to know 
how the victims of human trafficking are subject to the various deceits and ploys that take place. They know, they see, they are part of their communities. They are intricately connected through their structures of worship, through their means of volunteering of their time and energy. So when we think in terms of first responders globally, whether from those coming from communities where victims are often found and used and victimized, or whether from communities where the receiving end, women of faith are actually ideally well positioned to not only know what is going on, but to be able to serve because they are the very origin of the service sector in their respective faith institutions and communities. This is not incidental. This is a very powerful and very strategic piece of information and knowledge that we should have as those interested in and serving the anti-human trafficking industry because it is an industry. It isn't happenstance. It is not ad hoc. It is not a by the way. It is a well-organized, very complicated, intricate, highly profitable industry. And because it is an industry, the response to it cannot be limited to any one institution, political, military, security, or even religious. It has to be multi-stakeholder in nature. And we must begin, those of us within religious communities, need to begin from bringing together the fabric of those who are different religious actors together, ensuring that there is a multi-religious response as part of a multi-sectoral coordinated response to this industry of slavery and abuse today. It is not incidental that we talk about increasing levels of climate-related disasters around the world. The impact of this is more vulnerability for those already very vulnerable. It is not happenstance or incidental that we speak about the fact that 80% of what humanity is due to expect in terms of crises in the next 20, 25 years will be humanitarian in nature. This is not just as a result of the climate, which heaven knows is bad enough. It is also a result of public health issues as we are living together today in COVID. And it is a result of increasing conflicts within nations and between nations. All of this means that the increase of vulnerability is guaranteed which in turn means that we can expect more, more human trafficking, not less, which therefore means that it becomes absolutely imperative that we not work in specific separate institutions alone. Even if we were, please, please hear this, even if we were to mobilize every single government, even if we were to mobilize every single military, even if we were to mobilize every single police institution establishment, we would still not be able to counter human trafficking. And we are not able to mobilize every single government, every single security apparatus and every single military establishment. We are not. So therefore, we must strive to ensure not only that the existing religious institutions who are working in their specific spaces, Catholic here, Protestant there, Sunni Muslim here, Jewish there, it is not enough. And it is not enough to limit it to these specific religious institutions. We must encourage and demand accountability from all religious institutions to work together to combat this industry in its varied manifestations and forms. That becomes a minimum imperative of religious belief that every single institution and community can actually work together. And we begin with where we are today, which is where the 
the necessity of learning what is happening, of seeing what is happening, of identifying victims, of serving survivors, we must begin by that, by supporting this multi-religious awareness raising advocacy about human trafficking. It isn't a matter of choice because we know this is increasing. It is a matter of imperative. It is not enough when even the entire Catholic world works together to stop this. It is not enough when the entire Muslim world works together to stop the various practices and the various abuses. It is not enough when the entire Jewish world works together to stop this. We must work together across our religious infrastructure because none of our religions tolerates any form of human trafficking. So therefore, none of us should seek to work alone. We must work together. And this is what Religions for Peace is compelled to seek to do. And we look for your support and assistance as governments, as intergovernmental actors, as non-governmental civil society actors, insist on supporting multi-religious service advocacy for survivor, survivors of human trafficking, but insist and hold accountable each religious institution and each faith community to work together with one another in order to ultimately seek to eradicate the roots of the existence of this practice. And those roots are security. Those roots are peace. If religious actors are, are working together for social cohesion and peace in their communities, the conditions that lead to human trafficking would not be there. We therefore are compelled. In order to be believers, we are compelled to serve with one another to ensure that building peaceful, just and inclusive societies is not a sustainable development goal that's going to last for 30 years and then be evaluated, is actually the mantra, the obligation, the imperative of our respective faiths. And it has to be realized by working together. That is how we can ultimately combat the very roots of human trafficking. Thank you. So, uh, Professor uh, Azakaram broadened our view on the issue by explaining that the approach to combat human trafficking has to be not only multi-religious, but also multi-sectoral. So we stepped already a little bit out to the whole world, what is um, indeed very interesting. Um, now I want to give the floor back to uh, Dr. Ben Kiran in case you would like to have a conclusion and uh, there is a question in the chat that might, that was directed to Dr. Aza, but she is not live, but uh, it might, is a little bit related to what you presented too. So uh, the question is, if as Dr. Aza says, no religion supports, uh, what no religion supports uh, trafficking, no? which is possible, uh, how can religious leader convince their believers to stop uh, tacitly accepting servitude. That is also, I heard it also in your um, uh, presentation. I don't know if you want also to refer to this, but the main point I want uh, to ask you for a conclusion. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I will make a, a short comment on this. Of course, I'm not, it's a very important question, uh, but what I want to, I want to, 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 to raise the attention on the fact that being believers of being people of goodwill, uh, working for peace and convinced that religions are, you know, elements of stability, of peace, of relations between, between citizens, between, you know, cultures. I mean, I think it, we should be aware that there is ambivalence. Even within our religion traditions, we should be aware that religions may be interpret, interpreted in different ways. So I, I want just to quote 
one inhabitant from the side. To give you the example, for instance, on this question of slavery, as a Muslim, we know Muslims in their majority know that the Quran, the sacred text, do not encourage slavery. On the contrary, but it has not in the seventh century, uh, you know, been, uh, you know, uh, it, it has not forbidden sl slavery, but it has encouraged. It. When you read the Quran, you manifestly you understand that you know it is better to 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 to, to not rely on on slavery and it's better to to be free man etc but i want to quote someone from mauritanian uh, an official at the hospital of nema in mauritanian uh, and what this is his quotation you have to accept that in mauritania there are communities that are outsiders because of slavery sure it's true that slavery has been abolished in Mauritania, but see, but it's in it's in our religion. It's mentioned in the Quran. Mauritania is an officially an Islamic republic, and whatever efforts the states makes to abolish slavery, there will still be elements of it in our religion because we practice Islam. There are other groups we look down on, like the blacks blacksmiths. Everyone tries their best, but in a traditional old style Mauritanian family, if they meet a blacksmith, they won't accept him. Myself, if I was a blacksmith and I came to you and you pushed me away, I wouldn't come anymore. There will come a moment when I will be radicalized. I'll turn in on myself and I'll do something to get back at you. The children of blacksmiths could become radicalized and so they can do harm to those who have turned them away end of quotation what i want to to, to show in this uh, in this in this in this uh, testimony is that religion can be deployed in any way desired for instance we people of gold weight civilized educated we tend to to think that religion outlaws slavery but you, you can see that in the case of a Mauritanian, you know, citizen, because it is mentioned in the Quran, it is not interpreted necessarily as a as something that should not be encouraged, but on the on the opposite, that it can be legitimized because it is mentioned in the Quran. So what I want to to show here is that people. Uh, religious people and people that are active in Facebook group, in faith-based group, must do a work on the, you know, the theological political level, uh, in order to, to not let religious texts be interpreted in a manipulative way or in a, you know, in a way that may encourage, you know, issues like slavery. So. It is, I'm sorry to answer to, to, to the person who said that no religion supports, uh, uh, you know, human trafficking, etc. But we see in the past that Christians, that Muslims, etc. have used the, uh, you know, have practiced uh, slave trade, exploitation of men. Uh, and they are also, they were fully convinced by their religious and spiritual uh, ethics. So what I want to say is that we must go beyond this declaration of good intentions and be aware that religious te texts can be interpreted in many ways. They are ambivalent and it's important to produce new knowledge, new interpretations in order to be in phase of, with the current challenges of our times. So it is not sufficient to to, to seek like uh, on um, to rely on uh, our sacred text as you know theological asylum you know no we have to make clear what is what is uh, you know progressive what is encouraging what should not be uh, what could be manipulated uh, for bellicous purposes and things like that this is my my, my comment Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Benkiran. Uh, that was very, very deep and interesting. And uh, although I like the idea also to always uh, look on the religious texts with uh, what impact do they have? And because we have, I think, inside of us, we, we have this um, 
the, the law of God and we know that we have not to possess other people. So if we see the texts under this perspective of uh, what, we, what we should know uh, and having the freedom, what we know, then uh, that is a, it's a heavy work. Uh, needs a lot of education and needs a lot of uh, um, religious leaders speaking on it. So uh, thank you very much for, for explaining this to us. Um, now, as we approach the end of the webinar, I want uh, to give the word back to uh, Michel Vetti. Thank you very much, uh, Miriam, and uh, thank you very much indeed, Reda. Uh, I think you, you made very interesting uh, points. And uh, yes, at the end of this webinar, I would like to thank all speakers, including those who give, gave us uh, a video statements and participants. And my special gratitude goes to Yves Reichenbach, uh, our webmaster, and to my assistant in Geneva, Clara Izepi, and uh, my assistants in Nice, Pepita Alemani and Roman Diaz, as well as Yannick Galeazzi, uh, who is between Geneva and, and Vienna. This video recording of this webinar shall be available in a few days on our website uh, at laudatosi.org with subtitles in English, French, German, Italian, Russian, Spanish, and Chinese. Feel free to share the link. Our English online course on human trafficking for helpers is now translated and available in French on cuhd.org. I wish you the best and invite you to the upcoming webinars next year. We already are planning a webinar on sexual slavery of Christian and Yazidi women and on media and human trafficking, as well as uh, webinars on legal developments diminishing the demand of human trafficking. And if you have other good ideas, and I think uh, uh, I will ask again uh, Reda Benkiran if he has good ideas about uh, uh, what we could discuss together. I would be uh, very happy. Uh, so I uh, want to conclude and to say thanks again. Best wishes to all. Merry Christmas, happy holidays, and very warm wishes for 2022.